Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast. It's been a dramatic couple of days. There have been a series of major escalations in the Middle East, notably the beginning of Israel's invasion of Lebanon and a response by Iran, who fired 180 missiles towards Israel. The long-awaited Middle Eastern war that we've been predicting at the Revolutionary Communist International seems to be on the brink of breaking out. What does this mean for millions of people, not just in the region, but all around the world? And what's the communist position on this situation? And to help us answer all these questions, we have a regular guest on the podcast. Back again, Fred Weston. He's a member of the International Secretariat of the Revolutionary Communist International. Fred, always great to have you on. Great to be back. Spectre is haunting Europe. The spectre of communism. Communism is stronger, more determined than ever. Communist. Communism. The communist. The communist. The communist. Dedicated to the establishment so, of a new order. So, can you catch everybody up to speed? What's been going on? Well, <laughs> unless you're uh, living under a stone somewhere, uh, most people would know what's going on. Um, a barrage of missiles was launched at Israel and uh, most of them were intercepted, of course. Um, it was uh, Iran's response to um, what's been happening in, 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 the, in the past year. Um, now, the way the media is presenting it is terrible Iran um, attacking poor little Israel. Yeah. Well, the truth of the matter is that Israel actually is uh, the best equipped, most powerful uh, army in the region. They have the most advanced technology provided by the Americans. Um, they have, you know, the jets and, and everything else. They are a nuclear power. And um, if you, unless you're completely blind or prejudiced, uh, obviously, um, you cannot fail to see that Netanyahu has systematically upped the ante over the last 12 months um, with the aim of provoking a regional war. Um, everything he's done this last year. Now, of, of course, the Hamas attack last year is what gave him the opportunity to move in this direction. But if you see the level of destruction and the, 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 the number of people killed, um, you know, in the Old Testament, it says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Uh, what that means is that the God of the Old Testament was telling the, the Jews back then, that, um, that the punishment for a crime should be proportional to the crime itself. Mm. One person killed, you kill one person. Um, I worked out, if you look at the actual uh, number of people who have died, not just those who've been killed in direct hits in Gaza, but um, there was a letter to The Lancet a few months ago by doctors who worked in, in Gaza, and um, they've made a kind of a reasonable estimate of what they think from what they've seen, also in previous war situations, that anything up to 186,000 people may have actually died, i.e. 41,000 plus, almost 42,000 indirect hits, 10,000 apparently are missing and under the rubble, um, this huge amount of rubble has been created, and then all the people that are dying from illnesses which would otherwise be curable or, you know, you could avoid them in a normal situation where you'd have access to hospital care. And starvation um, and malnourishment, of course. That's right. Fact there. The, the number of children that are dying is, 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 is enormous. Um, nobody can actually say exactly how many. One day, somebody will sit down and look at the, you know, what you could call the excess deaths compared to normal times and see how many people have actually really been killed. And it would definitely be far, far more than the figure of 41,000. Mm -hmm. Among them, many, many children, innocent children, innocent women, innocent civilians, um, who have just been bombed to bits. Um, this is the real situation, not poor little Israel that's being attacked, but the powerful Israel at the heart of this region, which has been threatening the whole region. If you look at the speech that Netanyahu gave the United Nations, I don't think you can be in any doubt as to his intentions. He said, there's no place in Iran that we cannot hit. And he added, 
no place in the Middle East. That means they can, he, he's saying we can hit anybody. And in fact, they've bombed Yemen, they've bombed Syria, um, and they've, uh, they've uh, assassinated the leader of Hamas in Tehran. Um, what they're saying is we can hit anywhere. We have the weaponry for it. We have the forces for it. Yeah, they killed Nasrallah, of course. That's um, right. They, before that, they carried out a mass terror attack in Lebanon, which injured and killed hundreds of people, including right. many civilians. Well, that was clearly... I mean, at the time, there was a lot of speculation as to why that happened. Was it something they triggered because they thought they might be discovered? But if you look at the situation now, it's quite clear that... You see, the Israeli state and the intelligence services have been studying Lebanon, Hezbollah, um, since uh, 2006, mm. where they ended up with a stalemate and had to pull pull back. Um, they've been studying every possible detail they can get their hands on, bases, key figures, organizational structures, methods, etc. Um, a combination of electronic uh, spying and probably also infiltration they've managed to get quite a lot of details and when when they decided to go for Hezbollah um, the first thing they did was hit the cadres with the walkie-talkies and the pager uh, explosions um, in killing many and injuring thousands including innocent members of these people's families or people who had nothing to do with it um, they did that uh, to show that they have infiltrated the communication systems of Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. And then they went for the leadership itself and uh, killed Nasrallah and other leaders. Um, they're going in to smash Hezbollah. That's what they're thinking. Their thinking mm -hmm. is destroy their bases, destroy their cadres, destroy their fighting forces. Um, Israel has huge aerial uh, superiority you know Hezbollah does not have a serious air defense system it does not have an air force of its own so it's an unequal war obviously mm -hmm. um, Israel uh, has been bombing uh, sites all over Lebanon um, and they are he now heavily bombing uh, the southern parts of Beirut in particular um, the um, Dahiyeh region uh, district of, of Beirut. I've is... read estimates that already more people might have been killed in this last series of aerial attacks than died in the entirety of the 34-day 2006 war. Well, well, that's a fact. That's a fact, actually. Um, they've also you know, bombed in the Beka Valley and, and other parts of uh, Lebanon. A million people have been displaced. People are um, sleeping on the streets. People are uh, frightened of staying in their homes, people have crossed the border into Syria. Can you imagine how desperate the situation is that you leave Lebanon and go to war-torn Syria, which has an, enough of its own problems, um, to escape um, the warfare? How can any decent human being sit and watch all this on the TV screens? See the scenes of the children being blown to bits, um, people's homes being blown um, blown up, um, the devastation which is being um, uh, wreaked out to um, Lebanese, Gazans, the Palestinians in the West Bank, etc., and also the attacks in in other countries. Mm. Well, can I just focus on this point because I think that lots of people watching and listening to this podcast, certainly the millions of people who are watching these scenes unfold on their phone screens, on their television screens, in the newspapers, are asking themselves the same question. Why is this happening? Because there isn't general support for Israel's murderous war in Gaza. I read one statistic that said the public opinion of Israel in Britain is the lowest it's ever been. About 7 out of 10 British people have a unfavorable view of Israel. Most mm -hmm. people in most of the advanced capitalist countries that are backing Israel oppose the war that it's been conducting over the last year and now it's opening up an entirely new front mm -hmm. it's invaded a sovereign country we'll come to what that means in terms of the so-called rules-based order that our leaders are fond of banging on about but why has netanyahu decided to launch this invasion which we should be clear a lot of his out all of his allies the americans um blinken was very clear that 
they weren't in favour of this escalation. David Lammy said that Britain favoured a political solution rather than an invasion. Of course, they've all now lined up behind Israel, and we'll get to that later. But it seemed that none of the imperialist allies, the US, the, the, the British, the Europeans, particularly wanted this invasion. And yet, and, and in fact, there was a 21-day truce ceasefire. proposal, yeah, yeah. ceasefire, that was stitched up by a number of Western governments. And Netanyahu did his usual hokey-cokey, where he said, yeah, I agree with that, but then changed his tune almost immediately afterwards and stormed on ahead anyway. Why has Netanyahu opened up this new front? Well, you see, Netanyahu uh, had become very unpopular in Israel. If you remember, before this war broke out, before the Hamas attack of the 7th of October, there had been those mass protests inside Israel Mm -hmm. with a very large section of the Israeli population wanting to get rid of him. Yeah, you know, he, he's corrupt. Um, he's hated by a significant layer. They failed to remove him, um, in spite of all the protests. Um, he stayed in power. He stayed in government. Um, this war has, has, uh, meets his needs because, as long as he can create this mood of, um, how do you say, this fear within the population of Israel, there's an existential threat to them. Mm. Um, They've been cultivating this for decades, i.e., you know, we are surrounded by enemies. They've they've actually depicted all the Arabs as Nazis who want to destroy... It does seem that attitudes in Israel have hardened on this point. It it has hardened. Um, It it has hardened. Um, There is also reason for it. I mean, if you want to go further back, Israel was a state which provided, at least to its Jewish... Uh, citizens, um, a good standard of living, um, a good welfare uh, system. Um, life was, mate- from a material point of view, was good. But like all capitalist countries over the past decades, there's been a systematic whittling away of those services that were provided to people. There has been a polarization. There's been a growing level of poverty amongst a certain layer. It, it, it seems paradoxical that among the poorest layers of Israel are those that, that, that vote Netanyahu. Mm. It's a bit like those working class voters in America who fear who have lost their jobs or they've lost their good jobs, they've lost their good wages, and Trump appeals to them. I'm the guy that will help defend you. Um, a bit like Farage tries in Britain. Net- Netanyahu is, is, is a kind of equivalent of that. A bit like um, the Freedom Party in Austria as well. That kind of thing, Banging yes. on about, you know, how mm. the Ukraine wars made you all poor, the rich elites uh, making a mock of you. Yes, all, all of that. Appealing. And you see, that has created an electoral base also for Netanyahu. There is a section of society that supports him, and there's a big section that's against him. Um, now, he, he was also... In trouble, obviously, with the law over uh, several court cases, corruption, etc. And this is a very convenient way of um, delaying or even um, avoiding that mm. completely. A permanently postponing. Uh, by, yeah, because if you're at war, we can't we can't be putting the prime minister on trial in a time of war and all the rest of it. Um, and if you see his behaviour in the last twelve months, how many times have you heard Biden say? We have a ceasefire coming. It's going to be ready on Monday or Sunday, next week, uh, etc. And every time certain hopes are raised among certain people, oh, there's going to be a ceasefire. And then you see what happens. Uh, he, he manages to put a, a spanner in the works and create the conditions where the ceasefire does not happen. Well, in one case, by um, assassinating Hamas's main negotiator, on Iranian soil. That's right. And of course, we'll come back, we'll come to Iran. Well, the, well, the, in the a latest minute. example is what happened at the beginning of September mm-hmm. when uh, there's this, the, the, the Philadelphia Corridor, which is this strip of about 100 meters wide all along the border of Gaza with Egypt. Um, the IDF have taken control of that. Now, Hamas cannot accept, obviously, on, its, on the southern border of Gaza, a permanent military presence of, of the IDF. Um, and Netanyahu knows that. Mm-hmm. Now, when, the nego- when there was an attempt to negotiate the release of the hostages at the beginning of September, um, one of the conditions would have been pull the IDF out of the Philadelphia corridor, 
would have facilitated the negotiations, there was actually already the talk of a list of hostages that could be released. What does Netanyahu do? He adamantly refuses that. Mm. And he knows that that means the ceasefire negotiations would fail and he would not have to talk to Hamas. Now, that's where um, it's happened more than once, but this is one of those moments where he's like naked in front of the masses of Israel and what, what, what appeared to a significant layer of the population, he doesn't actually give a damn about the hostages. He right. doesn't care about the hostages. He's using them for his own uh, purposes. And that was noticed by at least a layer of Israeli society because there were big protests That's about right. that specifically. There was half a million more or more people. It even led to a, a, a short-lived general strike. Mm-hmm. That's how uh, much the opposition built up. Um, and in the opinion polls at that particular moment, if they'd voted in that moment, Netanyahu would have lost his government majority. Mm-hmm. Um, but as is his instinct, he knows in order to, to, to get a kind of national unity and whip up a mood around him, keep the war going, step it up. Now, in the fact is this, in Gaza, they have destroyed Gaza. They've smashed it to smithereens. They've destroyed the healthcare system. They've destroyed most of the hospitals. Massive destruction of the schools and universities. A lot of universities destroyed. Mm. Thousands of students who have, you know, cannot continue their studies. Thousands killed um, in, in this period. The level of destruction of the housing. It is an absolute humanitarian disaster for the, for the people of Gaza. And in spite of all that, they have not destroyed Hamas. Mm. The reports are that when they, when the IDF pulls out of a village or a town or an area that has been apparently cleaned up and cleared of Hamas, when they move out, it's Hamas that move back in, take over the administration, etc. Um, which means that, in spite of everything, they have not destroyed Hamas. Now that shows that there were two things the war was about. One was saving the hostages, failed to do that. Two, they have not destroyed Hamas. They've killed a lot of people. Yes, they've killed a lot of fighters, but they haven't destroyed it as a force. Now, the whole idea is we want to make the border with Gaza safe for the for, for, for Israelis living n- n- near it. Um, they failed to do that. Mm. That organization is still there. It's weakened, but it's still there. Um, so having failed on that front, and, and top military figures in Israel are actually saying that they failed on that front. From that point of view, although it seems like you could say Israel won. Have they? In Gaza, they have not won. Because in Gaza, for Hamas, simply to survive as an organization, for them is a win at a heavy cost, obviously, for the Palestinian people. But um, that's, that explains also why Netanyahu had to shift the emphasis to the northern border. Again, he's using the evacuees, 60,000 um, evacuees from the northern border who were moved because of the the rockets that Hezbollah was firing across the border since since last year, his stated aim to get is to set to bring the uh, evacuees safely back to their homes in uh, northern um, Israel. Well, again, how is he going to achieve that by actually massively hiking up the uh, the armed conflict on that border? But you see, he's played a useful role. He was going down in the polls after the hostages. Um, uh, saga the, the six that were killed um, since he's gone into um, uh, into Lebanon and since they've been attacking Hezbollah um, he's back up in the polls mm. um, and they've created a move you see Hezbollah if you think about it from an ordinary Israeli point of view is Hezbollah is far more of a dangerous force than Hamas ever was mm. um, Hezbollah has a powerful um uh, arsenal of weapons um even iranian guided missiles that can hit up to 300 kilometers inside israel mm. israel at the very most is 400 kilometers long um so they could in theory hit most of the heavily inhabited parts of uh, of israel um so it's seen as a real threat obviously to the people and netanyahu is presenting himself as basically the war hero the war leader that can save the people of Israel from this threat. But what he's actually doing is he's massively uh, hiking up the level of tension and conflict. But you see, he has a much wider objective, not just to widen the war to Lebanon 
and to attack Hezbollah. Hezbollah is, is an ally and a proxy of Iran. Um, to hit Hezbollah means to hit Iran. And it's quite clear from his behavior that he wants to provoke Iran to retaliate. The reason being that if Iran threatens Israel, then the United States have made it abundantly clear that in such a scenario, the United States will always back um, Israel. And therefore, to bring in the powerful military force that the US has behind Israel, he needed to provoke Iran. Now look at what he did. He bombed their embassy in Syria. The Iranians took two weeks, but they retaliated. They retaliated in a measured way. It didn't actually kill anybody in Israel. Mm. didn't even do any damage because the, the missiles were, 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 were stopped by the Iron Dome and with the help of the US and British um, in helping to... They also telegraphed it well in advance and they... Yes, they, they let they, them know. They, they gave the Americans their intentions yeah, through back channels. It was a channels. gesture to show that, yeah, we're hitting back. How dare you, uh, you know, hit our embassy and kill our people there. Um, but nothing really came of it. Um didn't didn't lead to a, a conflagration, you know, an escalation of the war. Um, he needs to up up it again. He uh, um, they they killed the leader of Hamas at the end of July, while he's a guest of the government in Tehran. That's a real insult, obviously, to the government of Tehran, and it's a provocation, a provocation to see how they hit back. Now think about it. They're presenting Iran as the aggressor. Yeah. Iran did not retaliate. No, and the whole time, the first thing that the Americans were saying, that the Europeans were saying, is that Iran must show restraint. That's right. And it no one's telling Israel to show any but restraint. But the point is this. Iran did show restraint. Yeah. The ones who are not showing restraint are the, are the government of Israel. Um, Iran showed extreme restraint. Um, and you could see what was going on in their heads. On the one hand, they don't want to seem to be backing off and giving in to Israel. Their reputation was at stake in the region. Also, um, it seemed as if they weren't even backing Hezbollah. The Hezbollah were complaining, the officials were complaining, to the Iranians were not backing them fully. You see, the Iranian regime did not want a war, a direct war with Israel, and in particular, a war that would involve the United States. Mm. They understand the consequences of, of such a war, so if you look at it, August passed, September passed, no retaliation. And everybody was, ah, it's coming, it's coming. And all the, all the analysts that were looking at it, they were, in, they were on a tight, they were like on the edge of a knife, basically. And I've said, you're looking at, we retaliate. They wanted to retaliate in such a way as to avoid escalation. The problem is this, you retaliate in April. You, if you retaliate again in August or September, you know that that is actually Netanyahu inviting you to retaliate in order that once you retaliate, he then has the excuse inside Israel and internationally presented as he has a reason to hit back. Now they're saying after yesterday's attack that Iran's going to pay for it. They're going to be, they're going to regret yeah. it. And we should be clear once again, basically nobody was killed. No major damage was caused as a result of right. these strikes. Right. And they seem to be largely targeting military sites, you know, right. air bases and this yeah. sort of thing. More than can be said for the way that the Israelis conduct their airstrikes in Gaza, for example, yeah. and Lebanon. That's right. And even when they hit the embassy in Syria, they right. killed a few people. Um, yes, you see, you see um, but Iran has been put in a position where if, if you listen to the speeches of their president... It was clear they did not want this confrontation at this right. level. But you get to a point where Israel keeps ratcheting, ratcheting up the, the level of conflict. And the logic is, at a certain point, Iran would feel obliged to uh, at least have a gesture of a retaliation, which is what they did. Apparently, it was like double the strength of what they did last time. But even this felt like a warning. Even this felt relatively restrained the, given that you're literally responding to the invasion of a sovereign nation to attack right. one of your key proxies right. in the region right. after all these other provocations you mentioned but the israelis were coming out you could tell they were waiting for an excuse they came out acting as though this was some 
horrendous, terrible crimes, That's massive right. attack on civilians that would be met with the strongest possible force. Yes. Again, it's worth emphasizing, over 150,000 Palestinians have been killed or maimed by Israel in the past year. Hundreds of people in Lebanon have already been killed in a war that's only just begun. Nobody died as a result of these strikes by Iran. That's right. And they knew that the Iron Dome would catch most of these. And obviously you have the Americans and the British sending warplanes to shoot down some of the missiles as well. But now Israel has the excuse Hmm. to uh, hit Iran hard. Uh, We will see. Nobody nobody can say exactly when. But they're clearly preparing um, a very hard... uh, retaliation against the retaliation mm. basically it's, 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 it's upping all the time and that was the problem with Iran whatever retaliation they, they, they carried out they knew that they, this would risk tipping the whole situation towards a regional war yeah. now they've gone they're, they're attacking Lebanon they have massively um, uh, hit Hezbollah but the war is only really at its beginning mm. because um, the, the, the war when it becomes a ground war of troops on the ground, Hezbollah is embedded. Hezbollah knows it's its own territory, mountain territory, etc. Uh, one one thing they showed they were good at in the past is the guerrilla type war, mm-hmm. um, surprise attacks, etc. They have much more sophisticated weaponry than uh, Hamas, um, and they can do what well, they can do a lot of damage mm-hmm. uh, to the Israeli forces. Um, so it's going, and, and the idea that Israel is going in for one quick um, raid and destroy what's left of Hezbollah is a utopian dream. If they, the, the idea that they can go in quick and get out quick, yeah. um, it, it's, it, that's not the way wars develop. No, I mean, every war in history has always yeah. been a quick little war that will score a quick little victory. That's right. And, and then more, they often get, not, more often than not, uh, it becomes a bloody and protracted and, nightmare. And then they get sucked in. And then they get sucked in. We'll come back to the prospects for the war, the events that we predict for the future, this wider Middle Eastern war that looks like it's essentially inevitable at this point. But I want to talk about the response by our ruling classes here in the West. It made me sick to my stomach last night when I was going on social media, I was turning on the news and I saw, you know, Kamala Harris talking about how Iran is this destabilizing presence in the Middle East. Keir Starmer, Sir Keir Starmer, always going to make sure you get his honorific in there, going on television and condemning Iran's attack, which killed nobody in Israel. Mm -hmm in stronger terms than he's ever been able to muster for anything that Israel has done. All of the kids, all of the innocent people, the men, women, and children, it's slaughtered. And he says that Israel has a right to defend herself. I don't know why he keeps calling Israel her. It's creepy. But you had this hail of condemnation by all of the Western politicians lining up to um, assert Israel's ironclad right to defend itself against Iranian aggression and apparently there's talks now of Netanyahu getting on the phone with with the Brits and with the Americans to talk about presumably how they can coordinate to conduct whatever their response is. Um, Netanyahu made a statement where he said that this is now the moment to deal a crippling blow to Iran's terror regime. Uh, He's made promises or allusions to attacking sites critical for their nuclear capabilities, attacking their infrastructure. And this all follows the invasion of a sovereign nation. Mm -hmm. I remember a couple of years ago when Russia launched its special military operation, its invasion of Ukraine, there was a hail of condemnation. It was wall-to-wall condemnation in the press. And, you know, bucket loads of money and arms were sent to Kiev so that the Ukrainians could defend their right to national sovereignty. There were diplomatic and economic sanctions leveled against Russia. None of that in response to this latest invasion. What does Israel call it? A limited ground operation. It's an invasion. We're a fan of saying things as they are on this show. They invaded a sovereign country against the wishes, actually, of the imperialists backing them. Not because they care about the Lebanese, but because they don't want a Middle Eastern wider war, for reasons we'll talk about. 
But where was the promise of aid and support to the Lebanese to defend their national sovereignty? Where's the condemnation of Israel's invasion of a sovereign nation? How do we explain this absolute rank hypocrisy, this disgusting double standard by our ruling classes? Well, you see, uh, the rules-based order. Oh yeah, the rules-based order. What, what it, if you want? What it means is this: that you do what is good for imperialism. Mm -hmm. Therefore, in Israel, what's good for imperialism is you support Israel. Um, now you see, in the Middle East, Israel is really the only reliable ally. Let's say of. Uh, U.S. imperialism and, and of the Europeans. Um, so whatever criticisms they may have about the way they do this or that, or, you know, ceasefire, um, or uh, the way they invade Lebanon, they can discuss their little differences. But when it comes to the fundamentals, the U.S. US imperialism, the British, the Europeans, will always back Israel. Always. Um, if you If you think... Um, Israel has an annual military budget of about $30 billion. Mm. More than 10% of that is provided by the Americans mm. as direct annual aid. Um, when Israel then needs special help, mm -hmm. earlier this year, there was an $8 billion package of, uh, of help. 70% um, of Israel's weapons come from the United States. Yeah, um, It's the big backer. And they will never back off in a situation where Israel is being attacked yeah. um, by other countries. Now, that's the, that is an important element in Netanyahu's thinking. He has pushed it to the brink, in spite of all the attempts to try and, you know, some kind of ceasefire, some kind of deal, to try and restabilize the situation. Um, that's in contradiction with his needs. Right. So he pushes and pushes because he knows when it pu the push comes to shove, the Americans will always back him. And look at what happened. He goes into um, Lebanon, and Biden, what does he say? And Blinken, they understand why Israel is doing it. It's for security reasons, and they back Israel in this, uh, in this operation. Mm -hmm. And they're backing them in a big way. They're moving their ships. They're moving their weaponry. Let's not forget that in that region, in the various military bases, um, you know, Kuwait, Bahrain, Syria itself, Iraq, there's a total of about 40,000 US troops right. um, spread around the region, plus all the, 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 the ships and, and all the rest of it. Um, and they are talking. I mean, all the talk is that they're now in, in, in discussions with the Israeli leaders about what to do next about Iran. Mm -hmm. Now, let's remember that there was a time a few years ago, if people listening rem might remember, there was talk of America possibly attacking Iran directly. Yeah, there were uh, vocal Iran yes, hawks in there Washington, was. for sure. And there is, there is a wing of the US ruling class which is always in favor of that. They want to smash Iran. Mm -hmm. They see it as a, um, a threat to their interests in the region. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. You've got to also understand... That the, the, the decline of US imperialism, the decline of the West, you know, when the West talk about the international community says this, the international community says that, the international community they're referring to is about a quarter of the world population. Yeah. Um, it doesn't include China, it doesn't include um, Russia, it doesn't include uh, large parts of Africa. And, and no, they're talking about about a dozen countries. They're talking right? about basically the old imperialist nations mm. of. of Europe and uh, North America, um, the, the, they, they, they are not as strong as they used to be. They're still powerful. The U.S. is still the, the big power. But you have rising powers, Russia on the one hand, and China. China is the real problem for the United States because it's its main competitor globally. Um, it's it's uh, that, that's, you know, at the, end of the, at the end of the day, the capitalist system is a system about making money. And a war is about defending the making of money. Um, and Iran is not a direct ally of Russia, but it's lining up. Yeah. Basically, the, the logic of the situation is Russia, Iran, um, China, 
North Korea is in there. Um, a kind of front is being formed um, on a global scale, which is in conflict in one way or another with the European Union, the North Americans, you know, the, the, the big Western capitalist powers. Um, so there's a wider picture here. The, there's a conflict in the Ukraine. There's a conflict in the Middle East. There's one big power involved in both. In the Ukraine, it's the U.S., which was pushing for the Ukraine to be a member of NATO and to bring NATO forces even closer to Russia, um, creating a real direct threat to the Russians. Um, you know, when, when people say this, they laugh. Oh, you really? I, it's a fact. You look at the whole history of the last 30 years, NATO has been pulling in more and more countries from the former Eastern Bloc and, and creating a kind of ring um, around um, Russia. Um, it is it is a threat um, to the Russians, and, and America is involved in that. In the Middle East, you have the conflict in which you have obviously Israel is at the heart of it. The other the other big power is, is Iran, which is more or less lined up uh, with with the Russians, and the Americans are involved. The big power, the big power which historically is in decline, but still the big power, is involved in both. Uh, wars. In that sense, there's a kind of connecting up of these fronts. Um, there's a, and it's interesting to note, somebody like Starmer, supposed to be a Labour leader, a leader of the British Labour movement. Starmer, w w where's the difference between Starmer's thinking and policies and those of the Tories? Where's the difference in his lifestyle also? If you look at the latest scandals. Yeah, the thousands of pounds of That's handouts right. and design addresses for his missus he's been taking. And Starmer uh, is taking away the £300 fuel allowance from pensioners in a moment where actually they're saying that energy costs are going to go up. Literally, his policy is going to kill some old people in Britain. And energy costs going up in no small part because of a Middle Eastern war That's right. that he's supporting. That's right. But you see, he's, he's attacking the working class in Britain as all the rulers are attacking their working classes. They're mm -hmm. all hitting workers' wages, workers' jobs, workers' living conditions. The same people who are doing this are arguing for upping the ante in the Ukraine, giving the Ukraine the right to fire deep into Russia, which has the potential mm. to massively increase the war. They seem to have backtracked on that, at least for now. They have. They have, because I think... Somebody, some, somebody with some modicum of sanity said, you realize this is, the, 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 this is actually a potential third world war you're looking at. Yeah. Um, they backed off. But this, the warmongering from Starmer and from all the others, um, and the same, these same people are also now backing Netanyahu's um, ratcheting up of the conflict in, in the Middle East. Mm. There's a kind of front there of bourgeois leaders, bourgeois politicians, who are fighting a war on the home front against their own working class right. and supporting the Netanyahu's um, uh, globally um, in in a war of um, which is oppressing um, peoples in the Middle East. Mm. Now, I, I wanted to go back to, to to one thing which we must never forget in this whole conflict, which is the Palestinian people. Um, you know, the, the way the bourgeois try to discuss politics or events is you single out an event and you say, ah, oh, you see, they did this. What do you say about this particular event? He shot first. He yeah. fired the first, the first um, uh, cannon to be fired was by them. Yeah, history seems to have started on the 7th of October, 2023. That's if you ask right. most of our political commentators and what, politicians. What they ignore is this. You see, talking about making money, hmm. before October the 7th, there was a process in the Middle East they call it normalization. Ooh. What it meant was normalization of the relations between Israel and all its neighbors. Yeah. Now, Israel had managed that with Egypt, with Jordan, and with others. The UAE, and more, to a more, and more recently, yeah, Bahrain had, had signed up. And, and um, the next one in line was Saudi Arabia. Um, the Saudis are de facto have been allies of the US. They're supposed to be, you know, Islamic, even the defenders of Mecca, and Mecca is there and everything, the holy shrines. And yet, they are de facto uh, friends of Israel. They're not keen on the uh, Iranians either. No, exactly. Um, but um, 
they wanted to normalize relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel, i.e., what does normalization mean? It means you can trade, yeah. you can make money, you can do good business. Yeah, we're talking about surprise before you came on, Fred. Like, yeah. It's like the mafia, it's, good for, it's just business. That's you know, right. It's, just, it's, it's nothing gangsters. personal, it's just business. It's gangsters getting together Gangster logic. to make money. But, little detail, there is a people called the Palestinian people, who in that process would have been completely abandoned and right. forgotten about. Um, and the Palestinians feel that mm. nobody, nobody is doing anything for them. They've lost all confidence in diplomacy. What has diplomacy achieved for them? Um, they've lost authority in the Palestinian Authority. They, they see it as corrupt and toothless in the face. Let's not forget what's happening on the West Bank. Yes. Um, over 700 people killed. Um, a thousand Palestinians have been pushed off their land in the yeah. last year and in I, 18 different communities. I mean, this is a dimension we really need to pull out because there is a logic to Israel's action separate from Netanyahu trying to save his own political skin and stay out of prison. The, the, the logic of the Zionist regime is the ethnic cleansing of what yes. remains of Palestinian well, territory. They, they want to create a greater Israel. Yeah. That's abundantly clear. They might the, the differences between the people at the top, yeah. you know, the Gantzes and the Gallants and the Netanyahu's, all these people, is not about the final objective. It's about how to get there. I.e. how to get there with upset without upsetting too much their Western friends, mm -hmm. without upsetting public opinion too much in the West, gradually step by step. But let let's not forget that Israel was created through war, ethnic cleansing. 700,000 people were violently expelled from their homeland in the historical Palestine. Not happy with that, they spent the next 20 years building up a powerful army with the help of US money. And when they were ready in 1967, they took the West Bank, they took Gaza, they took the Golan Heights, they even took the Sinai then, but then eventually gave, gave that back. But the big prize was the West Bank. Mm. They want the West Bank to be integrated and annexed to a greater Israel. They have systematically promoted the settlements mm -hmm. from a few thousand. We now have something like 700,000. And when we talk about settlements and settlers, we should be clear what we mean here are hundreds of thousands of well-armed and diplomatically supported and officially protected. Yes far-right Jewish supremacists who make it their daily mission That's right. to terrorize and force out by gunpoint, and by all... violence, by destruction of property, as many Palestinian Arabs yeah. as they possibly can. And, and all because apparently God told Abraham, Jacob and Isaac that um, this land is your land. Right. And uh, there are these fanatics who think that they are actually carrying out God's orders yeah. by going back to Israel and uh, taking back the land and uh, kicking out the Palestinians. These are fanatical elements which are being promoted on the West Bank. Of course. And they are defended by the IDF. They're armed and they're also backed up by the military, mm. systematically terrorizing the Palestinian people. They, they, a settlement appears, it, it gets electricity, well, water, good roads, everything. And, and backed up with arms, and then they spend their time terrorizing the local Palestinian population. Mm -hmm. I heard one video where one guy was saying the plan is to force them to leave. So instead of having to take them away in trucks, that's a bit embarrassing, you see, because there's the memory of what happened in Germany to, to, the, to, to, to the Jews under, under the Nazis. They want to create the conditions where the Palestinians feel so ter terrorized that they will leave. They, this is what is happening. But there's a whole people that refuses to abandon its historical homeland. What, what nation on this planet would accept having their homeland taken away from them violently without fighting back? Mm. The people of Britain, what would they do if, if a foreign power came in and brought in 10, 20, 30 million um, armed settlers with the aim of pushing out the British. Mm. You know what would happen. They would fight back and they would rightly fight back. Every people would would do that. And that's what the Palestinians are uh, doing. The, a, a crime has been committed against them. And on top of all that, they've had to suffer this last year yes. of the de devastation of Gaza, 
and the and the, the continued incursion in, into um, the West Bank, and now it's widening out to uh, attack Lebanon. A million Lebanese out of the population of Lebanon. There's no clear statistics about it, but the last ones I saw were six million. But you've got to add to that many refugees from Syria. Of course, um, but a, 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 quite a small population. A million people have already been displaced, and the destruction is going to continue. This is what Israel is doing. It has literally killed tens of thousands. I'd say probably at the end of the of this uh, drama, we will see hundreds of thousands will have been killed. Mm. And this is presented by Starmer and his friends, by Biden and by Macron and by all these people as Israel's right to defend itself. Mm -hmm. If you look at what they've done, it's a sick joke to describe that as defending yourself. No, you've used an event to push forward an agenda that you had for decades. They have systematically taken Palestinian land. The latest I saw is that uh, there's a plan, we'll see where they put it into action, the northern sector of, of the Gaza Strip, there's going to be an order to civilians to leave. Mm -hmm. Between 300 and 500,000 people are still there to leave, and whoever's left will be declared a Hamas fighter and can be shot on sight. Of course. The idea is to, to clear out the north. We see, if that happens, it reminds you what happened in 67 in a large part of the West Bank mm -hmm. when 400,000 Palestinians were expelled. Another clearing of an area of, of, of Palestinians prepares the ground for the new colon, for the settlers to come back in mm -hmm. and to take that land. Um, and the, 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 this would be another step in a long term project. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the history of the place, you can see right from the 30s, even before Israel was created, that was the long term plan. Yes. To create a homeland for the for the Jews at the expense of another people mm. that's the crime that was that was uh, that was committed and that's at the heart of this conflict mm. and unless and until the palestinians have a homeland they can call theirs where they are citizens of that homeland where they have all the democratic rights where they have the housing the health care the education that all peoples aspire to, unless and, and until that happens, this conflict will continue. They think they can smash Gaza um, back to the Stone, uh, Stone Ages, as some of, some of them have said. They think they can destroy the infrastructure. They can kill thousands of people. What they are doing is preparing another generation, all the young people that have lived through this experience, the trauma They've lived through seeing their friends blown to bits, seeing their schools destroyed, their homes destroyed, moved several times from one area to another, told to move into a safe area and then bombed again. Mm -hmm. To think that you can normalize conditions, that you can stabilize that situation. Having done that, these people must be living on another planet. Mm -hmm. They are creating future wars, future mm -hmm. conflicts, even bloodier than the ones that we've seen today. The answer to all this is this. This is the horrendous result of imperialist policies in the Middle East over a hundred years. Mm. They created this conflict. They've created this, um, this, uh, th these conditions. And, and so long as imperialism continues to dominate the planet, we will have wars, not just in Israel. We have the war in the Ukraine. But look at the Sudan. Look at the Congo, look at Burma, look around the world at the many wars that are a consequence of the local conflicts in which all the powers are involved in one way or another over raw materials, resources, markets, um, spheres of influence, etc. These guys dominate the world and they run the world in this way. And it's about sucking out the wealth of the whole planet for the benefit of a tiny minority of the billionaire class that controls the United States, Europe, etc. This, this, this bourgeois class has become a monster 
which is threatening the whole of humanity. Yes, absolutely. And this is exactly the reason that we've launched our international anti-militarism campaign, Books Not Bombs, because of this nightmare that we're being dragged towards by our warmongering ruling classes. But of course, there's another side to it, because war and revolution are often two sides of the same coin. And it's clear to me that part of the reason that actually the imperialists, if they could have avoided it, would have preferred not to see this war in Gaza spiral out to the rest of the Middle East is because they know that there's a huge amount of social instability throughout the Middle East. They have Arab regimes in the region that are essentially their allies. You mentioned a few, the Saudis, the Jordanians as well, assisted in shooting down these Iranian missiles that were sent towards Israel in retaliation for the invasion of Lebanon. There's a huge amount of anger amongst ordinary Arab people, the workers and poor, in the region about their own regimes that are not only manifestly refusing to do anything to support the Palestinians, but they're actively supporting the Israelis, the Egyptians as well, the military regime there. They're serving as Israel's border guards. They're helping to fence the Palestinians into Gaza like, you know, a canned turkey shoot. Well, you know, the Jordanian regime, um, have have you noticed every time... There's some tension, there's a conflict, there's a, a stepping up of the war. The Jordanians, the Jordanian regime expresses concern and calls for calm. Yeah, they're very concerned. Bringing, bringing very concerned things people. The reason they're concerned, they have good reason to be concerned. You see, um, in uh, Jordan, you have years of IMF-imposed policies, mm. which involve austerity, cutting subsidies. Youth unemployment is over 20%. Mm. Um there's a large Palestinian population in Jordan, um, and there are real serious social economic problems. People are suffering the consequences of the world crisis and the IMF imposed policies. The, the monarchy and the, the government is carrying out those policies. They are governing against their own people. And then when the missiles come over the, uh, the airspace of Jordan, they, they, back in April, they, um, participate in bringing down the missiles yeah now that <clears throat> they said it was because it was over their airspace that um, is seen by the masses in jordan as you are directly collaborating with israel and u.s imperialism the same government that is doing that is attacking their own people right when there are spontaneous marches and protests of young people in jordan to the border with mm-hmm. with uh, the west bank literally physically wanted to go and help their brothers and sisters across the river, they are beaten and arrested by the authorities in Jordan. The Jordanian regime is is extremely unstable. Mm -hmm. Um, The same in Egypt. Now, in Egypt, you have a situation where Egypt has kept itself out and has collaborated in keeping that border with Gaza nicely sealed. Um, at one point, the Zionists were playing with the idea, you could see it, squeeze the Palestinians south, 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 right up to the border. And some of them were hoping they could spill over into Egypt yeah. and expel a significant number. The Egyptians must have said to them, don't go down that, they don't want that problem. That problem, Lebanon was destabilized by such a problem in the mm-hmm. past. Egypt doesn't want that. And I'm sure the Americans would have said to the, to the Israelis, hey, don't, don't push on that front. Mm-hmm. Um, in exchange, Egypt has received uh, packages, loan deals, and the, one back in, in earlier this year, $8 billion package. But it comes with strings attached. Yeah. It comes with the quadrupling of the price of bread mm-hmm. because they've cut the subsidies on, uh, on grains. Egypt was also affected by the Ukraine war, by the way, because the upping of the cost because of the... The, 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 the cutting of supplies of grain because of the war. But they've massively increased the cost of electricity and other... They're basically... The, the IMF is saying to them, you've got to cut the subsidies on basic goods. The way life is made tolerable in a lot of these countries is big set state subsidies on things like bread, electricity, fuel, mm-hmm. which makes life tolerable for the masses at the bottom. That's precisely what they're hitting. And what they're insisting on is... You've got to do that and create the conditions to allow the market to flourish. Basically, the IMF goes around imposing on these countries their policies, which are you've got to pay your debt, 
to pay your debt, you've got to impose austerity, i.e. make the people suffer. That's what they're doing to Egypt, they're doing it to Jordan, they're doing it everywhere. The Lebanese people have suffered this already beforehand. The whole of the region, <clears throat> they are preparing an almighty backlash mm -hmm. of the masses of working people across the region, across North Africa, the Middle East. Um, the 2011 Arab Spring, as it was called, was in effect an anticipation of something much bigger. Mm. This war is actually um, speeding up that process. Right. It's connecting up the intolerable living conditions of the masses with this barbaric butchery that's taking place in Israel. This, 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 re this regime, which with impunity bombs Iran, bombs Yemen, bombs Syria, now massively bombing Lebanon after having um, devastated Gaza. The people watch all this. Nobody punishes this crime. Mm. These are not crimes. This is, as, as Stan would say, the right of Israel to defend itself. Yeah. It makes you sick to your teeth to listen to this. Yes. Um, they are carrying out a historical crime against the Palestinian people after 70 years of crimes against the Palestinian people. And now they're spreading that crime to Lebanon and beyond. And they're prepared to push for a regional war which would be devastating for millions and millions of people in the region. On top of all this, you have the impact this would have globally on the economy, for yes. example. Yesterday, I was looking at the Financial Times headlines as these events were unfolding. And just as it, Iran had announced they were going to fire the missiles, it, was, it appeared as a title in the Financial Times, the stocks fell and the price of oil went up. I've got it, I've got it here. It's interesting to see the logic of capitalism, if you permit me one second. Yeah, yeah. Here's an oil price spikes and stocks tumble as Iran launches missile strike. Mm. But interestingly, there's another kind of stock which didn't fall. European defense shares rise as Middle East tensions intensify. Interesting. A massive increase in just a few hours, like something like a 5% increase in... Um, in, 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 in about three or four hours. So you see, um, globally, this could actually tip the economy into a recession, like what happened in 73 mm -hmm. and then the 74 recession, because the world economy is on the edge. Many countries are either in slow growth, stagnation. Some are already technically in recession. There's a slowdown everywhere. China's slowing down. The US is slowing down. Even where we've had um, a significant growth, it's 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 uh, slowing down. Um, a, sh a shock like this, which could up the price of oil, uh, the instability, etc., the Red Sea, the Suez Canal, the Houthis, all of this could create a shock to the economy, and people who think that Israel is far away from them will s will feel the shock waves hit them in terms of a recession, job losses inflationary pressures, um, something like what we saw in the middle of the 1970s. It, it, it has global consequences. So effectively, we're in a situation where one man's desire to keep his job and a tiny minority of wealthy, powerful parasites' desire not to lose face on the world stage is dragging the world towards catastrophe. The working class all over the world will be forced to foot the bill for this catastrophe. And we've made this point a number of times in other episodes about the increasing militarism on the world stage. These people know that this is going to happen. They can see the disaster coming. And yet they are dragged along. They're dragged by the nose by warmongers like Netanyahu into these catastrophes. And what really makes me <laughs> enraged is when they say, oh, well, you know, we didn't want this to happen. We tried to find a diplomatic solution, but Israel has its right to defend itself. We can understand where they're coming from. They act as though they could do nothing. They could do something. If they wanted to, America could stop the flow of arms to Israel, stop the flow of aid to Israel. True of all the Western countries, they could cut off Israel from military and financial and diplomatic support that it desperately needs in order to keep its war machine going. And it would cause the 
military in Israel to fall apart within a matter of weeks or months, at best. They don't do that. We're a year on from the beginning of the genocidal war that Israel launched against Gaza. There were already big demonstrations planned all over the world in the US, in Britain, and throughout Europe um, to coincide with the anniversary of the beginning of the war. But of course, this has acquired an even sharper character now because of the opening of this new front and the very real prospect of a wider Middle Eastern war. We're going to be at those demonstrations, comrades of the Rev- we're going to be at those demonstrations, comrades of the Revolutionary Communist International all over the world will be forming blocks and participating. What are we going to be saying, Fred? What are we saying about this war and about what we say is needed? Because look, we've been marching for a year now, every single week, or at least every fortnight, depending on the country. There have been huge demonstrations. You had that entire encampment movement by students, that very heroic and powerful Mm -hmm. movement that was basically crushed into submission. Um, But nothing seems to have gotten any better for the Palestinians. So what is needed? What are we saying, first of all, and what do we say is needed? Just just, just on one thing you were saying first, Mm -hmm. earlier. You see, we mustn't create the impression that we think that this war is because there's a few evil individuals. Right. Um, otherwise, that would that there is a logic to the conflicts taking place because of the global crisis of the system. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a there's overproduction on a global scale. There's massive overcapacity. There's a conflict for markets. Mm-hmm. The big conflict, the most glaring one, is the one between the United States and China. But not only. There are conflicts glo- everywhere you look. You look across Africa. You, you, look, you look across Asia. There are conflicts in which the different powers are involved. There are different parts of the world in which one power or another has more influence. And there is a conflict to maintain their spheres of influence and to expand them where possible. The sphere of influence in the Middle East of the United States, from U.S. imperialism, goes through Israel and goes through the Israeli government. So there's a logic there. It's not just, I mean, there is, there is the element of the individual, but there's also the, um, you know, it's like the avalanche. Was it, was it that, uh, that little grain that hit and caused the avalanche, or was it the accumulation of contradictions that came beforehand? And then what it takes is one little action and it tips the whole thing over. There is a logic. It comes from the crisis. There's another element. So, so sick is this system. So incapable is this system of guaranteeing people a reasonable life, a reasonable standard of living, a school for the kids, a home, etc., that um, the the serious, the so-called serious bourgeois, the only message they have for the working people of the world is everywhere is austerity. Increase the age of retirement, increase the working week, cut pensions, cut real wages. Um, all of this is happening, and the masses of people are suffering from this. And that explains the eruptions of conflicts and the wars that are taking place um, globally. Now, what do we say about the, um, the movement for, basically, the movement against war? It is not in the interests of working class people, of young people, of, of workers in general, to promote wars. Um, which are not to defend the interests of working class people, but to defend the interests of the powerful elite, of the ruling classes. It's not in the interests of British workers to support Israel. It's not, it's not in the interests of American workers to support Israel. It's in the interests of the American ruling class. Now, so long as the world is controlled and dominated by these powerful imperialist countries, the, the, the destinies of millions of people around the world will be wars, revolutions, counter-revolutions. We've had eruptions of revolutionary movements in Bangladesh. We had it in Sri Lanka last year. We had the Sudanese revolution. Do you remember the glorious days of the, the revolution, that young lady mm-hmm. standing on, 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 on a vehicle talking to the masses. There was a euphoria. We've overthrown the dictators. We have bloody civil war in Sudan now. In Sri Lanka, we have a government which is carrying out the policies of the, even this incoming government, which is a reflection of the changes, is going to go negotiate with the IMF. They are still under the thumb, under the boot 
of the imperialists. So what can what can young people, workers, workers in countries like Britain or or the United States or Europe or whatever, in the countries which is the heart of imperialism, what can we do for the Palestinian people? What can we do for the people in Lebanon? We can fight the people like in America who are providing the billions for the military budget of, of Israel, who are providing the weapons and the technology for Israel. Fight them on the home front. The same in Britain. Fight our own government. Fight to remove the people who run these countries and bring to power governments which are workers' governments, which defend the interests of working people, who would have a completely different policy towards these countries. We could have cooperation between the advanced industrialized countries and the so-called developing countries because it wouldn't be in the interests of, of, of workers' governments, of the working class in power, to oppress other people. So the best thing we can do is create a movement, an anti-war movement here, make it as big and powerful as possible, and co but connect it up with the problems in each country. Connect up the fact that Starmer is a warmonger in the Middle East, but he's the same guy who's taking away uh, the energy subsidy for, for old age pensions. And not just that, his plans for the NHS and, and all the rest of it. It's the same enemy mm. that's fighting workers outside of this country and fighting workers in this country. It's the same struggle. Therefore, create a movement to overthrow these people, not just to remove this or that government, but to radically change the system, a system which is not based on private property of a few billionaire capitalists, but on the common ownership of the means of production, i.e. what the workers produce, the wealth which is produced by the working class should be used by the working class for a good NHS, for good education and not for billions of, of, of weapons that risk, if you think about it in the long term, actually risk the, the destruction of the whole of humanity and civilization. Mm. That's where this system is going. That's why it's our duty to fight, not just on one demonstration, or two or ten or whatever, but to systematically work to build a, an alternative within the working class, which has a clear analysis, a clear understanding of what the problem is, and also a clear understanding of what the solution is. And the solution is you can't tinker with this system. You have to remove the whole system and all its politicians, all the top uh, business people, the capitalist class, take the wealth and put it in the hands of working people, run it in the interests of humanity. That's what the RCP in Britain is fighting for. That's what the RCI, the Revolutionary Communist International, is fighting for on a global scale, i.e., create a political force which can actually create a revolutionary movement in uh, in the advanced capitalist countries to begin with to overthrow the imperialists and finally put an end to their warmongering on a global scale. All right, here, here. And I think that we need to end with the immortal phrase of Karl Liebknecht that the main enemy is at home. And that's the attitude that we're going to be taking into the demonstrations that will be conducted all over the world this weekend. If you're in London, I might see you there. But no matter where you are, find us if you agree with our ideas. The RCI will have blocks and all these demonstrations. And if you agree with our perspective and you also want to see an end, not just to this war, not to any one war, but to war full stop. That means fighting for an end to capitalism. And for that, we need a revolutionary international organization, which is what we're trying to build. So as ever, get involved, get in touch, and let's build that organization while there's still time um, to provide a decent and dignified existence for all of humanity. Fred, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me again. Right, solidarity, comrades. Down with the warmongers. Books, not bombs. Healthcare, not warfare. The specter of communism. Communism. Stronger, more determined than ever. Communist. Communism. The communist. The communist. The communist. Dedicated to the establishment of a new order. Just what is communism? I'll guarantee that ten minutes from now, a lot of you are going to have a new understanding of communism. <laughs>